Welcome to Phoenix Masonry Live. A show about Mas Masonic Museum artifacts. Interviews. Masonic history. And much more. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry. And I am Elena Yamas, Director of Public Relations for Phoenix Masonry. And we are here to... Celebrate... Our Freemasonry! Celebrando nuestra Francmasonería. And today we're celebrating with old friend Francis Foster from Setucket Lodge, East Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Fran is not only the past master of the lodge, but he's uh, done a lot with the history of the lodge and updating the history of the lodge. And he is the reason we are here today because Fran Foster in the 90s started a Masonic TV show from cable TV. Somewhere, I'm going to ask him, but somewhere around 1994. And uh, I was with him when, we, when he did this. And uh, we have followed in his footsteps. And he is the forerunner of what we do now. So, hey, welcome, Fran. Fran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Been, so thank you. It's been a long time. So uh, you wanted to say a few words about your Masonic history and how you started in Freemasonry. Well, I, I was in the, I was in Demolay. You remember Doug Young? Yes. He was my he was he's my best friend. Yes. And we met we met in a Demolay chapter, Osamaquin Demolay, down in Campello in Massachusetts, part of Brockton. And we went all the way through the degrees in DMLA. Well, I got to be of lawful age and I had to leave. And I went in the service for two years. Well, then I, when I got out of the service, I started back with my company and a, 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 one of the fellows, one of the salesmen lived in East Bridgewater we had moved to East Bridgewater, and he says, did you ever think of joining Masonry? Well, you know, I was in Demolade, liked it. Mm -hmm. So he, he sponsored me to be a Mason. And we started through the, the uh, degrees. Well, I was in April, May, and June, I think it was, that I was had the three degrees and was made a Mason. Well, a few years later, well, my brother-in-law was in there also, because he was a district deputy when I was being when I was being master. And along the way, I had thought, well, gee, you know, I don't see much activity in Freemasonry. Let's let's just see if we can get in the parade, Memorial Day parade, uh, go with our uh, aprons and uh, collars and let the people know that we're still here. We did that. We had a pretty good representation from the district. And we marched, and it was it was fun. And a lot of people knew who we were, waved at us, and had fun. Well, one particular time, it was a Memorial Day, and they were going to have the Mount Rushmore flag. Now, this flag goes around the country, or did go around the country, on a special truck. The flag is 40 by 60 feet. <laughs> that is huge. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's big. So they had uh, a crane come down, and the crane hooked onto that flag and lifted it high into the air. And it was a breezy day that day, and the flag was flapping and blowing. Well, to bring it down, they lowered the flag into a line of Cub Scouts and uh, uh, Masons or people. We created the flag in our arms as it came down on the crane. And we carried it like a snake onto the, tr onto the truck. That was a big thrill. Really got a charge out of that. And so I went to the program director of Continental Cable, says, 
Could, you, could we do a uh, show on Freemasonry? Oh, yeah, one time show. He says, sure. Oh, nice. He says, I'll do you one better. You give me a show a month and I'll give you a permanent time slot. Huh. Oh, great. <laughs> so we started in. And Fred Milliken and Dick Kusick were in the first program. I look a little and different now. <laughs> we're going to know it. We're going to be airing it right after this interview. <laughs> so I want to get a couple of dates in here, if I can, Fran. First of all, you, you talked about sure. your, when you were made a Mason. Do you know what year that was? Was that around? 1964. 64? Hmm? Wow. 64. Wow. So you've been a Mason wow. for how many years? A lot of years, right? 50, 53 years. Wow. wow. Goodness. Wow. Yeah. And now, when you started this this uh, t TV show on cable, you know approximately when it was? Was it around 1994, somewhere around there? Uh, 94, 95, yeah. Uh, thereabouts. Right. As soon as I got in the masonry, I, had, I was sat in a seat hmm. for a chair. Yeah. <laughs> An officer. Yeah. I went in as senior steward. Uh, I, I had sat in, in the, uh, as the inside sentinel for a while. Well, our viewers are going to be able to, to uh, see some of this programming that you filmed uh, right after this interview, but also over time because, Fran, thank you very much on behalf of all the Phoenix Masonry for donating such a wonderful uh, video collection uh, to us, and we're going to be sharing it with you. And so once you were given this spot, once you knew you were going to do this, what did you set out to do? Did you set out to explain masonry to the general public? Uh, what was was there an overall theme to the program? Uh, masonry had been in East Bridgewater since 1881. It was a daughter lodge of another lodge that was chartered in the East Parish of Bridgewater. In 1797 hmm. and the charter for that chapter or the, the lodge was signed by Paul Revere oh wow we're big that, Paul Revere but, fans here aren't we uh, Fred <laughs> and, that, and that's a lodge Fran and I have both been to many times Wow Wow yeah. wonderful and so the, the people had to travel in the in that time in the dark long distances by horse or wagon to get to the lodge so it was called a moon lodge now a lot of people don't know what a moon lodge is a moon lodge is when the lodge meets on or before the full of the moon right so they had the light of the moon to travel by well in nice. 1823, I think it was, the Fellowship Lodge moved down to Bridgewater. And the people in East Bridgewater had to move down to Bridgewater to go to lodge meetings. Well, they wanted their own lodge. You had to have a certain amount of Masons, and they, Grand Master, had to okay it, and you met on a certain night. Very strict rules on being a lodge. Uh, you had to hold your meetings, 10 meetings per year, uh, no more, no less. You, you could, yeah, I'm sorry, you could have more. <laughs> uh, so in 1881, the people of East Parish, it was East Bridgewater by then, decided to have their own lodge. So it was named Satucket. Now the name Satucket means the meeting of two rivers in Indian language. It was an Indian name. Satucket River travels down and joins with the Taunton River. So they had the meetings. And it was chartered by England at the time. Interesting. Now for mm -hmm. some reason or other, the, the Masons had difference of, differences of opinion. 
there was one group wanted this and wanted it this way, and then the other group wanted it another way. So for a long while, the, we couldn't uh, associate with other, the Masons of the other lodge. Hmm. One of them was the ancient free and accepted Masons, and the other one was the United Grand Lodge of England. Two different systems. So there were two different Grand Lodges. Well, most every place in the world, the lodge will have a number according to their precedence in Grand Lodge. So like uh, Satakat number one would be the first lodge that was chartered in that particular area. So we were 1881 that we, we made a lodge. And in 1903, there was the merging of the two factors so in Massachusetts, which, by the way, is said to be the third oldest Grand Lodge in the world. Really? So, so Massachusetts decided that rather than have all the fussings of who's for number one, there'll be no numbers. So that's why we have no numbers in Massachusetts. Yeah, that's that. That was the ancient and modern split, and it, it yeah. happened in various well, places. It was, it was different ritual, right? Right. So, uh, Fran, you had uh, something to do with uh, updating the history of your lodge, just Tuck at Lodge. Tell us a, a, a little bit about that, and when it, when you started updating the history, and how what did what did it involve? Uh, did it involve uh, putting the minutes in the computer, or did you do more than that? Both. <laughs> uh, there was a, a history that had been written in 1956, and it was quite interesting. A lot of people there uh, told of how things went. But this was in 1990s now, and it had never been updated. So what I did is I got the secretary's minutes and went through each and every page wow. looking for certain things that I could put in there that would help to tell what was going on. Uh, I found out that there was one of our members wow. was lost with the Titanic. Oh. Ooh. By the uh, interest, by the notification in the large minutes <laughs> they announced his name that he was lost so you, you put this all together and then did you put it in the computer I put it into my it? computer so I could put it out and I took right. some pictures they never had pictures back then so one of the pictures that I had was the house of Hector Orr he was the first master of Fellowship Lodge. Nice. In 1897. That house is long gone now. Uh, Fran, you, your, your lodge is not active today. Uh, you merged? No, because we got to a point where we could not attract members. Hmm. We did not have enough members to fill a line of offices. So we merged with our fellow with a parent lodge, the Fellowship Lodge. And you did a lot of topics, Fran. Uh, you, you did yes. the right, uh, uh, you did the uh, Scottish right. You, you kind of explained things to people so that the average person could know more about Freemasonry. Uh, that, yeah, that the was bit that I idea. watched, I really liked that. It was really explanatory. Uh, go, go on, Fran. So, I mean... That was my uh, idea. Right. Is there any particular show other than this first one that we're showing now? Uh, another show that strikes your memory that you'd like to mention? The Shriners. The Shriners. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that a little a little story that's not in there. Go My ahead. wife and I were campers. Yes. We had an RV. We stopped in an RV store. And we went to the dealer 
and he started explaining about the rigs, the, the motor, the trailers that we had. And I told him that we go out camping with the Masons, <laughs> National Camping Travelers. Oh, oh, okay. Is that anything to do with the Shriners? I says, well, you have to be a Mason to be a Shriner. So then he proceeded to tell me, guys, his son was playing with a pro, uh, pressure can of paint. Oh. And he put it in a fire. Mm. And the can exploded. Mm. Here he is sitting there trying to tell us that his son was badly injured when the thing blew up. But the Shriners took him down in Texas and did everything for him and kept the, the salesman and his wife in around in the area. Wow. And it didn't cost him a penny. Imagine the that. Shriners paid for every bit of it. Well, it's just, it's just to show how, how, how deep the, the touching of uh, lives goes. Uh, yes, Fred? No, I was just saying the Shriner Burns. They, I've, I've toured them, and they, they, they do such wonderful work. Uh, my brother-in-law's daughter, she worked for the Shriners out in Springfield. And you know what a cliff pallet is? Right. Yes. She invented a device that goes into the mouth. And they build it, rebuild it, rebuild it as the child grows up. Hmm. Interesting. And it straightens that cliff pallet out. Wonderful. It's just fantastic work. Well, we've enjoyed having you on, Fran. And uh, okay. we're going to be showing that first show. And uh, people won't recognize me. They might recognize you either, but. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a name tag. <laughs> I'll put, I'll edit in the arrow saying this is Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, we all, Elena, we all took lessons in how to wow. operate the camera, you know, because mm -hmm. I was a guest on a few of the shows, but then I decided I wanted to do some camera work. So <laughs> I, did yeah. I did a little bit of camera work when a uh, friend didn't need me on the show and he was interviewing somebody else. But, but Fran, no. you, got, you got two pa uh, past grandmasters to come in to East Bridgewater uh, on a local <laughs> table. So uh, how did you get two grandmasters to come in? Call them. You called them. Ask them. them. You ask them. <laughs> well, today, Fran, we can get them on this show, you know, via uh, wherever they are, but they had to physically walk into the studio. Well, well thank you so much. And this is, uh, well, it's not all we have for you this time. We, uh, stay with us because the show starts now. Hi, my name's Fran Foster. I'm the master of Setucket Lodge here in East Bridgewater. With me tonight are Dick Cusick, master of Paul Revere, and Fred Milliken, master of Plymouth Lodge. We're here to talk to you tonight about what it means to be a Mason. We have a short tape to show, and we hope to dispel some of the rumors and let you know what masonry is all about. Fran, just a question. Why did you end up picking this tape, what it means to be a Mason? Because it, it tells what it is, who we are, and what we do, the best that I've ever seen any uh, medium show. 
And you know, Masons uh, traditionally have not spoken about what they do and who they are to the general community. Yes, we've been known as the quiet society, uh, kind of hiding in the bushes, but it's time that we let people know who we are and what we do. You know, the funny part about you saying that is way back in the early 1800s, going into the 1900s, everybody knew who the Masons were. They, oh. they, they were the, the businessmen, they were the, you know, they were, they were the, mostly the elite of the cities that you lived in. Oh, and today, certainly. Uh, today, the mason is the man down the street, the garbage collector, the gardener, the banker, the insurance agent. It can be anybody. Uh, we take men of all, kind of all countries, sex, and opinion uh, to uh, exemplify what mason, masons are and what we do. And you know, I think this film will destroy some of the myths that are out there about masonry. I hope so. That would be great. You know, talking about the myths and what the film is going to do, what do you think? Why don't we just roll the film? Sure. Yeah, let's watch let's it. Let's see what it looks like. Sounds good. To me, it means that I'm improving myself as a person. I'm helping out, and I'm giving back to other people. And really, you can't put any dollar sign on that. It's a nice organization to belong to. I have now I have friends from Falmouth, uh, like the Berkshires. There's a great satisfaction in knowing you've done well, even more so than someone telling you so. There is great satisfaction that comes from being part of a group that shares traditional values, that believes in the brotherhood of man, and in doing good works just for the satisfaction of doing them. That's what it means to be a Mason. Masonry in Massachusetts has a long and honorable tradition, dating back to before 1733, the year that the Provincial Grand Lodge of Masons in Massachusetts was formally organized under the leadership of Henry Price at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern. During these early years, many of the nation's most famous patriots were Masons. Men such as Washington, Hancock, Revere, and Franklin were all Masons. Many of the patriots who participated at the Boston Tea Party were believed to be Masons. And others, such as Dr. Joseph Warren, who was a Grand Master, sacrificed their lives at Bunker Hill to preserve our freedom. Masonry dates back to the late 14th century and flourished during the Middle Ages when guilds of Freemasons traveled throughout Europe, building the great Gothic cathedrals. Apprentices were taken in and taught the craft by master masons who passed on the secrets of the trade. As building declined, the guilds began to accept members who were not actual stonemasons. From these roots evolved masonry as we know it today. Masons identified their work by symbols that they carved onto the stones. They identified themselves by certain things they said and did, signs and tokens, when they entered a lodge or, or came to a building site and introduced themselves as workmen. This was carried forward into modern times by certain signs and tokens and words and manners in which people identified themselves as Masons. I guess that that's where we get some of the uh, uh, questions about the secrets of masonry. It's not a secret organization, but there are some secrets, and those are parts of the traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. That tradition of trust and confidentiality has been important throughout the history of masonry. The values that were important to masons then are just as important today. One of the uh, important features of masonry today I think, is that uh, it still holds to what might be called old-fashioned traditions and standards, and it teaches its uh, members to act right in their dealings with one another, and some people have said that maybe that's uh, religion. Well, we would say it certainly is uh, basic to religion, but masonry is certainly not a religion. Well, it's uh, really people of every country, every sect, every opinion. There are people of every religion. And 
their common goal is that they want to improve themselves and they want to improve those around them. I got involved through a good friend who had been like a second father to me. He had been active in Masons himself for a number of years. And, you know, I respected him. He was very active in the community. When I got out of college, he suggested that, you know, it might be a good time to consider uh, doing some things myself within the community. I asked my friend what it was like to be a Mason, and then I went and sat down with a number of members of the lodge, and they told me what was involved in becoming a Mason. And it sounded very interesting, and that's when I asked if I could also become a Mason. When I first applied to, to the lodge, it was primarily through a, a man that had worked for us. I had a, a past master that was working for me. He was the bookkeeper, and I, I was just interested in it and didn't really know that much about it when I applied. So I, I applied and went through and found out a lot. I was aware of a number of people who were members and uh, never really got around to asking. I was not aware that you have to ask to be a Mason. I had to ask the question, to find out about masonry because masons don't solicit for membership. If you feel you would like to be a member, well then you may come forth. And all of the masons that have ever joined have come forth on their own and asked the question. That's, that's a basic, basic principle. Eric Parsing and I were like father and son. He was so good to me. I was, a, I was the first guy he brought to Northwestern. My senior year at Northwestern, uh, I was invited to quite a few of the bowl games. And, and, uh, and I sit down with Eric because, like I said, he's like my dad. And uh, Eric said, well, the only game I really want you to go to is the Shrine game, the East West Shrine game in, in San Francisco. I go to San Francisco, and, and uh, part of the Shrine uh, program was to go through the hospital. And I went through the, uh, the Shriners Hospital, and I was devastated. And then I saw the love that they gave to the kids, and that's where I am. And that's and I proceeded to make up my mind I want to be part of the family. Most important thing is the people. It's the people that I have met. Just a great bunch of guys. You meet hundreds of guys that you probably never would have met before. Who becomes a Mason? Accountants? Businessmen? Teachers? Contractors? anybody and everybody. They come from all walks of life and all levels of income. And in the Masons, they're all equal. Teddy Roosevelt uh, visited his own lodge while he was president. He attended the meeting, enjoyed it thoroughly, and at the conclusion of the meeting, he rose and asked permission of the Worshipful Master to speak. And at the conclusion, uh, he turned and thanked the Worshipful Master who was his gardener on his estate in Long Island. It doesn't make any difference whether a man's a bricklayer or a physician. They meet on an equal ground and on equal footing within that lodge room. The thing about the, the ritual work, the actual work that's done in the lodge, is that it's the same work that's been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. Every Mason, no matter where you go, has had the same traditions and gone through the same degree work. And that's one of the things that holds us together and really makes us brothers. There are just a lot of things that you don't know take place behind the scenes. And uh, the only way you can find out, really, is by becoming active in it. Freemasonry is built on three basic tenets, brotherly love, relief, and truth. Brotherly love is the practice of the golden rule. Relief is charity for all mankind, and truth is honesty and adherence to the cardinal virtues. Masonry teaches its basic lessons through allegory and symbol, using the traditional tools of masonry, the gauge, gavel, square, level, plumb, compasses, and trowel. The newly admitted Mason is instructed in the principles of his craft through ceremonies that take him through a series of degrees. The ceremony takes the Mason on a symbolic journey, 
expressed in a complex tale based on the building of King Solomon's temple. The working tools represent the moral lessons taught during the three ceremonies or degrees of admission. In the first degree, which uses the gavel and the gauge, the entered apprentice is symbolically reminded of his dependence on others and his subordination to God. The square, the level, and the plum are the working tools of the second degree of fellow craft, which reinforces the central moral message of masonry. In the third degree, that of the master mason, the trowel and all of the other tools are used to teach the candidate to reflect on the end of life and the value of fidelity to the promises he has given. Once the candidate has been raised to the third degree, he can move on to other branches of masonry, such as the Scottish Rite, York Rite, and Shrine. The lessons which are taught in masonry are universal. In Japan, on the altar, were not only the Holy Bible, but also the Gita, the uh, Koran, books of all religions, and masonry does not discriminate. As long as a man believes in a supreme being, he can become a mason and meet on the level with all other masons. In masonry, we talk a lot about square dealing and meeting on the level. As a businessman, I can relate to that. I enjoy a square deal. I like to give one and I like to receive one. And that's really what masonry is all about. There are over 300 lodges in Massachusetts with some 60,000 members from Springfield to Boston, from Andover to Hyannis. The local lodges, also called Blue Lodges, each have their own character. The Grand Lodge, located in Boston, is the oldest Masonic organization in the Western Hemisphere and has been functioning continuously for over 250 years. Masons in the United States contribute probably something approaching two million dollars a day for the benefit of their fellow man. The Masons are collectively the largest donors of blood to the Red Cross in the state of Massachusetts, with some 20,000 pints of blood donated yearly. The Masons are the founding sponsors of the Shriners Burns Institute, the Shriners Hospital for Crippled Children, the Scottish Rite Masonic Museum of Our National Heritage, the Knights Templar Eye Foundation, and Schizophrenia Research Programs. They also support other activities, such as drug and alcohol resistance education, or DARE, Demolay for boys, Rainbow for girls, and literally hundreds of others on both the national and local level. The Shriners Burns Institute is dedicated to treating severely burned children. It's funded through the activities of Shrine Masons and offers its services without charge. In both treatment and research, Shriners Burns Institutes have been leaders in advancing the state of the art of burn care. It's very traumatic care, it's intensive care. And to watch them walk out the door uh, for the first time uh, gives everybody a great sense of pride and accomplishment. From hospitals to museums, the Masons seek to enrich the lives of those around them. The Museum of Our National Heritage was started by the Scottish Rite Masons as a bicentennial project. We feature changing exhibitions dealing with American history and culture, but also a few permanent exhibitions. We have one gallery devoted to our Masonic collection of materials and another exhibit that features Lexington's participation in the Revolutionary War. One of the Masons' major events is the annual Grand Masters Country Fair, held every summer on the grounds of the Masonic home in Charlton. Proceeds from the fair go to support the Masonic retirement home, open to Masons and their wives. As master of our lodge, I uh, received a call one day from a, an elderly member who asked about how to gain admission to the Masonic home. He and his wife wanted to move in. Uh, in checking, I found the procedure. We went through the interviews, and they, in due time, moved in. And I've subsequently visited them many, many times. And honestly, I know they're very happy that they're there. But when I go to visit them, I get, a, I get an even better feeling. 
This is the fourth annual Jamaica Pond Fishing Festival. A group of concerned people, masons, city and state agencies got together and uh, decided to have a festival for families, youth uh, on the pond. A lot of these kids have never even seen a fish before, let alone tasted one, and hopefully they're going to have an opportunity to do that today. You bring it down to the most basic level, why do we do this type of thing? And uh, for me personally, it's, it's a very selfish reason. It makes us feel good. Everyone gets the same pay, and it, all the pay comes right here. Those are the things that excite me more than anything else. When people give from their heart, I mean, they give deep. The truths you learn as a mason are personal and private. But the values echo the past and are something you carry with you for the rest of your life. This tape really shows what it is to be a Mason, doesn't it? You know, Fran, I'm really glad you picked that tape. Uh, as Freddie said earlier, it really takes out the myths and the different things that people think about Masonry that really aren't there. Uh, you know, I, I love it when they talk about the secrets of a Mason. There are no secrets. You can go to any public library in the world and learn anything you want to know about masonry. You know, the only secrets that we have are our methods of recognition. One of the things that really impressed me when I first started in masonry and when I first thought about being a mason was, wow, how far back we go. All the way to the you know, 1700s and, and probably a lot further than that. Well, it was around a lot, lot time, lot, long time before that. It goes back, uh, it's documented back to the times of the Crusades uh, in the 1300s. You know, one of the nicest things about it, too, as, as Masons, as we know, when we're in Lodge, everything is symbolic of back then. You oh, know, yes. and, and that, to me, is what makes our degree work so, to me, impressive anyways. It, oh, it, yes. You know, when some young person's coming in or, or a new person's coming in, they get to see and listen and hear about the language back then. And, and we use the old English, as we all know. And, and it's so impressive to somebody for the first time ever walking through the portals of our doors. You know, I, I was given a lecture at one of, the, one of the degrees, and I happened to find an 1894 uh, book on masonry. And that lecture was the same as it was then, a yeah. hundred years ago, word for word, in, in, in the same lecture. You know, the nice thing about it, too, talking about even just back to 1894, everything that we do as masons, if a man is a mason, he has done it. There is nothing different for each person. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's the same from one person to another. You know, and we talk about religion and, and color and whatever else it might be. People think that there's a stigma that you have to be a certain type of person to become a Mason. As the film showed, you don't. You know, Freddie, we were talking earlier before the film, uh, and, I, and I'm glad in the film it brought it up, the story about uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. You know, and if they didn't catch it, why don't you just repeat that story one more time about the gardener and... Teddy Roosevelt and the gardener. Teddy Roosevelt was at his lodge and he asked to leave. He asked the worshipful master for permission to leave. And he was asking his own gardener, you know. who was the worshipful master. Now, he was the president of our country at the time, wasn't he? He was the president of our country at the time. You know, that, that really shows us, Fran, that anybody, I don't care who it is, can be a Mason. And, right. it, and it shows that we're all equal. We're all on the same plane. And there are no heirs, and there's, there's no uh, caste system there. We're just all equal in the lodge. Like I had said earlier, it's people of every sect, country, and opinion who are Masons, and we all come into the door the same way. There are two things that are not allowed to be discussed in Masonry, in a Masonic lodge, as you know. One of them is politics, 
and the other is religion, because those are the two divisive things that would stir up arguments. And they're just not allowed in the Masonic Lodge. And I think it's important to emphasize the fact that we're not a religion. Oh, certainly. We teach moral lessons. We say nothing about salvation. And that we, is so true. That really and is. we have no sacraments. No. Although we do have a Bible open all the time on a, on a, in our meetings, uh, it is symbolic, and we teach moral lessons with the uh, implements of masonry. You know, talking about the film, and everybody has just seen it, Fran, what was the, what's one of the biggest reasons that you really like being a Mason? What do you get most out of being who you are in the Masonic community? The friendship, the fraternity, the hundreds and hundreds of people that I've met, yeah. made friends with, that I never would have known otherwise. I can go to any place in the country, and as soon as I make myself known as a Mason, I'm among friends. Yeah, it's true. Freddie? That's important. But for me, it's the moral lessons that we teach. I've learned a lot how to apply to my daily life those moral lessons. And I think I'm a better person, or have become a better person, because I, I joined Masonry and listened. Oh, certainly. If, if you heed to the lessons that we teach, you can't help but be a better person. You know, and the funny part about it, you know what, the, the most, the nicest thing I get out of Masonry is the fun I've had with the kids. Yeah, as you both know, I'm so involved with the young D. Malay and Rainbow kids in our, in our Masonic community. The, the way I've got to watch them grow up and become something of themselves. We, of course, every town or city has a boys club or a girls club, but this is something that we take personal and we, we take our pride in what we do with the D. Malay and Rainbow. And to me, that's what Masonry is all about, what we're doing for the kids in our cities. What we're doing for others. Yeah. It's and nice. and I, I have met people that I never would have met any other way. Oh, certainly. Dick lives on the same street. Yeah. <laughs> we never would have known each other had it not been we joined Masonry, I bet you. I mean, he's on one end of the street yeah, and I'm on the yeah, other. Yeah. I'm going to become a Knights of Columbus next year. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it is so great. Uh, the friendships that we've made, uh, the things that we do. As you saw in the tape, we are very involved in the Shriners Burn Center. Uh, you know, before we go any further, talking about the things we do, I understand that you have a display going on somewhere in town? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, during the month of June, in the East Bridgewater Public Library, we will have a display of Masonic memorabilia and artifacts going back hundreds of years for people to see. And we'll be running this tape for, for Masonic awareness, to let people know who we are and what we do. Now, is everything that we have in Masonry open to the public at the library? Yes, there's a lot of books there, and there'll be books on display, uh, books that you can draw out to uh, read and learn about Masonry. Supposing, uh, Fran, somebody had a question, who, who could they turn to? Oh, they could call me. All right. I live here in town, 378-3240. Uh, but you know, I can answer any questions that anybody has. Fran, I'm really glad you picked this tape tonight, uh, what it means to be a Mason. I hope the people that watched it uh, got something out of it. I hope they've learned a little something more about Masonry than what they knew beforehand. And I've seen the tape a number of times, and I, I was just thrilled to see it again. You know, it's so I, nice. I learn a little more about it every time I see I, it. I love the way the oh. tape starts off panning across the city over the Charles River. You know, to me, that is what Boston is. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, recently, I got on the electronic bulletin board, and the Grand Master is going to uh, reenact the laying of the cornerstone in the State House, July 4th, 200 years ago, uh, laid by Paul Revere. <laughs> We pledged our allegiance to it when we were young. The flag was still there. We studied its importance when we were in our teens. We sing its praises at every sporting event. We display it when we celebrate. Present. Lower it when we mourn. Our flag is presented on behalf of a grateful nation. And honor our heroes with it when they've fallen. 
the flag of the United States of America. It stands for what we are and what we believe in. How we treat it says a lot about us. Hi, I'm Art Paul Gosler. As a teenager, I've seen what drugs do to other kids. Not everyone takes it seriously, and that's why it's important for kids to participate in D.A.R.E., the drug abuse resistance education program that's taught in schools across the country. D.A.R.E. teaches kids how to say no to drugs, resist peer pressure, and build self-esteem. To find out how to start a D.A.R.E. program in your school, call 1-800-TALK-KFC-DARE. Drugs are no laughing matter. <laughs> Janine woke up in a cold sweat with one thing echoing through her brain. Who was this guy in her bathroom? Meanwhile, Barry was thinking, whose bathroom am I in? Janine remembered going to the party the night before and getting smashed out of her mind. Barry remembered getting drunk and acting really stupid. Eventually. The whole evening came back. Oh, I must be really stupid. I must be really dumb. What did I do? How did I get myself into this? Well, what did I do? How did I get myself into this? What about... What about... What about AIDS? Then they both realized, much to their relief, that unlike the rest of us... They were just cartoons. Get high. Get stupid. Get AIDS. Work is the great equalizer. It's a bridge that allows people to recognize and join each other in an understanding way. Here in the Commonwealth, there are well over 1,000 people with disabilities who are competitively employed. These people have gone from being dependent on the service system to becoming independent taxpayers. Hi, this is Fran Foster again. Thank you for watching us tonight, and this will be the first of many programs that we hope to produce in the coming months uh, to tell you all about masonry, what it is, and what we do. Thanks again.